good morning, everyone. Um, today, I will be discussing uh, dissociating in depersonalization and derealization disorder. This is my conflict of interest slide. Neither I nor any members of my immediate family have a financial interest arrangement or affiliation that could be perceived as a real or apparent conflict of interest related to the content or supporters of this activity. Objectives, after participating in this session, attendees should be able to interpret the five DSM-5 text revision criteria to diagnose depersonalization and derealization disorder. They should be able to examine risk factors that contribute to dissociative episodes, including emotional neglect and trauma, and they should be able to create a treatment plan based on rating scales and concurrent comorbidities. So case one, 19 year old male with chief complaint of existential thoughts and dissociation presents for his first psychiatric evaluation. He describes dissociating as leaving reality when he's feeling down and overwhelmed. He states it occurs about once or twice a month and he's unable to gauge how long these episodes last. Of note, he has a history of childhood trauma and recently resumed seeing a therapist prior to coming to see me. He also has no history of previous psychiatric medication trials. Case two, 22 year old female with chief complaint of, I've got a dissociative disorder of some type. She describes dissociating as everything feels muted and it feels like I'm watching a show I walk around in. Um, she also said that it's as if she's zoned out. Um, she states that it occurs when she's feeling strong emotions and stress and that these episodes occur a few times a week and can last from two to three hours, but would feel like 10 hours have passed for her. Of note, she has a history of childhood neglect. And prior to coming to see me, she had seen a therapist and a psychiatrist a year ago. And at that time was prescribed hydroxyzine on an as needed basis and was prescribed acetylopram to take daily, once daily. But when she came to see me for her initial intake, she was also taking the acetylopram on an as needed basis. She also was not seeing a therapist when she came to see me for the first time as well. So what is dissociation? It's defined by the DSM-5 text revision as a disruption of and or discontinuity in the normal integration of consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, body representation, motor control, and behavior. It's basically a break in how the mind handles information. It's frequently associated with a history of trauma and the term dissociation can be considered to be an umbrella term as in the DSM-5, there is a chapter on dissociative disorders. And in that chapter, you find dissociative identity disorder, dissociative amnesia, other specified dissociative disorder, and depersonalization and derealization disorder. Just to briefly go over the other conditions, there is dissociative identity disorder, which is denoted by the presence of two or more definite personality states or possession of experiences. And an individual, they'll, they'll experience recurrent intrusive thoughts that affect their sense of self, contributing to the different personality presentation. And this is most commonly associated with severe trauma in childhood. There's also dissociative amnesia, in which mental impairment will affect the autobiographical memory of an individual, usually as a result of trauma or severe stress. It is potentially reversible. And there's a subtype known as dissociative fugue in which the individual can unexpectedly and suddenly wander and even travel while in a dissociative amnestic episode. Then there's other specified dissociative disorder, 
And the DSM-5 describes this as when dissociative symptoms are present along with functional disruption and distress, but do not meet criteria of any of the disorders. Examples of this can include chronic and recurrent syndromes of mixed dissociative symptoms, identity disturbance due to prolonged and intensive coercive persuasion. Now, coercive persuasion is defined as being tortured, indoctrination while being kidnapped, uh, being a part of a cult, those scenarios. There's also acute dissociative reactions to stressful events and a dissociative trance when the individual dissociates in whatever form, whether it's dissociative identity disorder, dissociative amnesia, depersonalization, and derealization, they're so deeply involved in that episode that they don't respond to any sort of external stimuli, like if you poke them or talk to them or try to get them out of it. And finally, we have depersonalization and derealization disorder, also known as DDD for short. Per the DSM-5 text revision criteria, it is A, presence of persistent or recurrent experiences of depersonalization, derealization, or both, and I'll specifically define these shortly. B, reality testing is intact during episodes. So when an individual is depersonalizing or derealizing, they're able to interact normally with their environment. Um, they can answer questions, have conversations with friends and family members, making it difficult for the family members or friends to pick up on. C, symptoms cause clinically significant distress of impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. D, the disturbance is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance, drug of abuse, medications, or another medication condition. And E, the disturbance is not better explained by another mental disorder, such as schizophrenia, panic disorder, major depressive disorder, acute stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or another dissociative disorder. So diagnostic and associated features, what does depersonalization mean? Per the DSM, it's characterized by a feeling of unreality or detachment from or unfamiliarity with the individual's whole self or from aspects of the self. So individuals who depersonalize will come in saying that they feel detached from their entire being. And they can say things like, I am no one, or I have no self. They may feel subjectively detached from aspects of their self, including feelings. They might report having no feelings, feeling numb. They might say things like, I know I have feelings, but I don't feel them. They might detach from their thoughts and say things like, I feel like my thoughts aren't my own and my head is filled with cotton. And they might detach from their whole body, as I previously me just mentioned, or body parts. Um, a lot of individuals who depersonalize will say that they feel robotic and they lack control of their own speech or movements. And what is derealization? It's defined as unreality or detachment from or unfamiliarity with the world, be it individuals, inanimate objects, or all surroundings. So the individual detaches from their surroundings. This term was added to the DSM-5 and people who do realize will say that their surroundings are colorless and artificial. They might state that during this episode, they're like in a fog or that there's a glass window between themselves and the world around them and they're watching what's happening. Case two patient describe it as everything becomes black and white and it's as if I'm watching my life as a TV show. People who do realize have also um, endorsed subjective visual and or audio distortions, meaning that while they're in this derealizing episode, they can have a narrowed or widened visual field. Their vision may get blurry or it might even get sharpened and sounds can either become muted or heightened. Further diagnostic and associated features, individuals who come in dissociating specifically in the realm of depersonalizing and derealizing 
will come in having a lot of difficulty describing their symptoms and initially state that that they're crazy or that they feel like going crazy because they don't know how to they don't know how to begin to describe what's happening to them. They may also have an altered sense of time where they may feel like time is speeding up or slowing down in between these episodes and during these episodes. They may present with a possible fear of irreversible brain damage because of what's occurring to them. And they may also have preoccupation, bordering obsession about their existence and can check their perceptions consistently to see if they appear real. They may also present with vague somatic symptoms such as head fullness, tingling, and lightheadedness. Prevalence of DDD, the lifetime prevalence is in the range of 0.8% to 2.8%. Um, transient experiences of depersonalization and derealization are very common. This is similar to when someone says that I zoned out or I tuned out. In fact, one half of the adult population um, have experienced an episode of depersonalization and derealization and typically lasts a few minutes to perhaps a few hours. The mean age of onset of DDD is around 16 years of age, but it can develop in early and middle childhood with no memory of these episodes occurring. After the age of 20, the likelihood of DDD onset drops down to less than 20%. And after the age of 25, the likelihood of DDD onset drops down to less than 5%. The onset of DDD in the fourth decade or above is very rare, but if it does occur, organic causes need to be ruled out. The duration of depersonalizing and derealizing can vary. It can come on suddenly or it can gradually occur too. And it can last anywhere from a few hours to a few days, which is considered to be a, an acute episode, or it can become a prolonged episode where for some it can last for weeks, months, and even years. The intensity of how um, depersonalizing and derealizing uh, may occur for an individual also can vary. Um, it can wax and wane, um, or it can be unwavering and constant. The intensity can also be affected by external things such as light and sound, um, the individual having little to no sleep, as well as if the individual experience, excuse me, experiencing stress or um, um, has a mood or anxiety disorder. Risk factors for DDD. It's equally common in males and females. Psychiatric conditions can be a risk factor as well. Most commonly depressive and anxiety disorders. Um, alexithymia is also a risk factor as well. And what alexithymia is, this is when an individual has trouble processing and expressing emotions. Um, in fact, studies have shown that patients diagnosed with DDD tend to have high rates of alexithymia, which also ties into what I mentioned earlier about de, uh, depersonalizing, where people have difficulty describing their emotions. Substance misuse can also be a risk factor for DDD. Um, in fact, substance misuse has been found to be the cause of 15% of all cases uh, of DDD. Um, substances involved include salvia, marijuana, ketamine, MDMA, and ecstasy. Other risk factors include severe stress, financial, interpersonal, or occupational stressors. Um, and when DDD is diagnosed, they have been shown to exacerbate further episodes of depersonalizing and derealizing. And acute or chronic trauma is also a risk factor for DDD as well. pathogenesis of DDD. So there are organic precursors that can lead to depersonalizing and derealizing. This can include seizure history, mild to moderate head trauma, brain tumors, sleep apnea, as well as substance misuse. Structural changes are also implicated as well, 
specifically the prefrontal cortex and the right temporoparietal junction. Um, in one study, patients diagnosed with DDD were shown emotionally aversive images. And when these images were shown, MRI scans of their brain showed decreased neural response in those regions associated with emotional processing in the prefrontal cortex and showed an increased neural response in those areas of the prefrontal cortex responsible for emotional regulation. And recent studies have shown evidence that the right temporoparietal junction is involved with multisensory integration, sense of embodiment, as well as out-of-body experiences. MRI um, scans of the brain in patients with DDD have shown changes in the right temporoparietal junction. And fMRI scans of the brain in DDD patients have also shown alterations in gray matter volume, as well as the hypo, as well as, excuse me, hypoactivation of the limbic system, which is thought to be the cause of the hypoemotionality many patients with DDD present with. The vestibular system also plays a role um, in DDD as it helps control balance, spatial orientation, motor coordination, and also plays a role in self-awareness. Um, disruption to the system is thought to increase a likelihood of dissociating, specifically derealizing, which is when the individual detaches themselves from their surroundings. Um, several studies in individuals who have shown, um, excuse me, in individuals who have been diagnosed with peripheral vas vestibular disease have had an increased likelihood of derealizing compared to healthy individuals. The relationship between DDD and genetics is currently unknown, as no studies have been conducted so far, and trauma plays a big role in the onset of DDD as well. So the role of trauma. Depersonalization and derealization can be a normal response to acute trauma, such as getting involved in a car accident or having a life-threatening experience. It's kind of like the brain's way of initiating a survival mode where the individual can process the event without feeling um, overwhelmed emotionally. Now, depending on the extent of the acute trauma, the depersonalizing or derealizing can clear within minutes, hours, or days. However, it can also trigger further episodes of depersonalizing and derealizing to the point where if they experience it frequently enough can lead to a diagnosis of DDD. Chronic trauma is also um, a major factor for DDD long-term exposure of high stress situations or trauma. Now, the specific type of trauma that has, been, that has been shown to be strongest and consistently associated with DDD is a history of childhood interpersonal trauma, which can consist of emotional neglect, emotional abuse, having a parent who's mentally ill and witnessing domestic violence. Of note, there's also the dissociative subtype of PTSD, of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is when the individual has the full-blown diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder with trauma-related nightmares, intrusive thoughts and flashbacks, hypervigilance, numbing, um, and crowd avoidance, as well as the hyperstartle reflex, and also have periods where they depersonalize and derealize. Um, here, the trauma isn't necessarily emotional abuse, but the cause of trauma can also be physical, sexual, or military combat related trauma. So assessment of DDD, it involves evaluation, imaging, and rating scales, including the dissociative experiences scale and the Cambridge depersonalization scale. In terms of evaluation for DDD, the standard thorough psychiatric and medical history um, is implicated. Neurological history is usually not routine and a urine drug screen can be ordered if substance use is suspected. However, individuals who depersonalize and derealize, excuse me, um, tend to develop a phobia of ingesting substances because um, 
of their fear of having a depersonalizing or derealizing episode. So there's usually a phobia seen in many DDD patients of drug misuse. Imaging for DDD is usually obtained when the diagnosis is uncertain or when atypical present, symptoms are present. This is usually depersonalizing and derealizing that starts at the age of 40 or above, or if they present endorsing blackouts, head pressure, numbness, tingling, seizures, their family history of seizures, or motor or sensory symptoms. Typically CT and MRI of the brain are obtained and an EEG if seizures are also present. Rating scales for DDD. This may be useful for clinicians who are not extensively familiar with dissociative symptoms. And currently there are two major types that are used. There's the dissociative experiences scale and the Cambridge depersonalization scale that can be used during an evaluation. So the, the dissociative experiences scale is also known as the DES. It was created by Eve Bernstein and Frank Putnam in 1986 and consists of 28 questions. And it typically assesses the percentage of dissociation that an individual experiences on a daily basis. Um, it is important to note that it is a screening tool that assesses for all dissociative disorders, not specifically for depersonalization and derealization disorder. In 1993, an update of the DES was made um, by the same authors and consists of the same 28 questions, but they differ in response format. And most recently, the brief DES was developed in 2010 and consists of eight questions about dissociative experiences, sorry about that, in the last seven days. Um, this might be the most useful for clinicians who are who aren't extensively familiar with dissociation and is also useful to track severity over time. So like I mentioned, the DES is a screening tool for all dissociative disorders. So as such, it has three subscales. It has questions targeting the amnesia factor in which they'll ask about memory loss, it also has questions that target the depersonalization and derealization factor. And it also has questions regarding the absorption factor, which is an individual being so preoccupied or absorbed by something that they're unaware of what's going on around them. And it's typically usually um, associated with their traumatic experiences when they're absorbed by something. Scoring is averaging all of the questions. There's a minimum score of zero and a maximum score of 100. A score of 30 and above indicates high levels of dissociation. Again, there is a form of dissociation happening, but it's not specifically depersonalizing or derealizing. So when the clinician Im implements this rating scale and they see that the individual has scored above 30, it is an opportunity for the clinician to open up discussion and have the patient elaborate more on their dissociative episodes and to give examples. The DES has been found to show good convergent validity with other dissociative scales and for interviewing, as well as good predictive validity regarding dissociative disorders, traumatic experiences such as PTSD, as well as abuse. But there was a meta-analysis that showed that the discriminant validity might be questionable due to patient response and interviewer bias. Therefore, it's recommended that this scale be implemented by different evaluators and that the scores be averaged to assess um, the levels of dissociation occurring. And in doing so, it gives current views on past episodes of dissociation. I unfortunately cannot put in the full 28 question scale on the slide because it was too um, truncated, but I was able to get a snapshot of the first eight questions. And, it, and as you can see, it asks questions as a percentage of how much it occurs of um, dissociation occurs in their daily life. 
Um, this is the brief dissociative experiences scale. Um, it consists of eight questions and each item is, is on a five point rating scale. The total score is from zero to 32, but what the clinician needs to follow is the average total score. Now, the average total score will reduce the overall score to a five point rating scale in terms of dissociation, which is zero where no dissociation is occurring. Score of one indicates mild dissociation is occurring. Score of two indicates moderate dissociation is occurring. Score of three will indicate severe dissociation is occurring. And a score of four will denote that extreme dissociation is occurring. Again, dissociation in general is occurring, not specifically depersonalization or derealization. So it's important that the clinician follow up and have the patient describe what their dissociation consists of. In the DSM-5 field trials, clinicians found this to be useful, reliable, and easy to use during um, their evaluations and follow-ups. Next, we have the Cambridge Depersonalization Scale. This was developed in the year 2000 by Mauricio Sierra and German Berrios. This consists of 29 questions and is more specific to DDD and it correlates well with that DES depersonalization derealization subscale that I had mentioned previously. This scale rates both frequency and duration of depersonalization derealization experiences over the past six months. Scoring of this involves the sum of the frequency and duration numbers, and an individual can have a minimum score of zero and a maximum score of 300. Now a score above 70 distinguish depersonalization and derealization disorder from other mood anxiety or neurologic disorders. Now the Cambridge depersonalization scale was found to have good internal um, consistency and um, excuse me, high internal consistency and good um, reliability, but it may be limited in its accuracy as it doesn't differentiate between current depersonalization and derealization episodes and past depersonalization and derealization episodes. And depending on the individual who has trouble describing how long their episodes last, that can also affect the accuracy of the scale as well, since there are um, answer choices for duration of episodes, depending on what the question asks. Differential diagnoses to have with DDD. There's illness anxiety disorder. So individuals who depersonalize and derealize can present with vague somatic symptoms, but DDD is diagnosed with the typical constellation of the depersonalization and derealization symptoms in the absence of the other illness anxiety symptoms. Major depressive disorder should also be a differential when considering DDD. In fact, 73% of individuals who are diagnosed with DDD are found to have concurrent unipolar depression with the depersonalizing and derealizing being the most prevalent symptom. There's also obsessive compulsive disorder as a differential diagnosis. Um, individuals who depersonalize and derealize will have obsessive preoccupation and rituals regarding their episodes and may vary in severity, but the other symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder are usually not present in DDD. What is interesting though, one study did find it to be a comorbidity in 20% of individuals that were diagnosed with DDD. There's also other dissociative disorders. So depersonalization and derealization should not occur in the context of a person presenting with different personalities like in dissociative identity disorder or in the context of an individual who is having autobiographical memory issues. Panic attacks should also be a differential for clinicians as depersonalization and derealization can be a symptom of panic attacks, especially as panic attacks worsen. However, the diagnosis of DDD should not be considered if the depersonalizing or derealizing occurs only during the panic attack in the context of social anxiety disorder 
or if there's a specific phobia present. Many individuals can have a first onset of depersonalizing and derealizing that can occur when they first have a panic attack or if their panic attack worsens, a panic disorder worsens, excuse me. Psychotic disorders as a differential, the big difference is in depersonalization, derealization disorder, as I mentioned, reality testing is intact. They're able to respond to their environment, answer questions and have full on conversations, which differentiates it from a psychotic disorder as individuals who are you know, diagnosed with schizophrenia and are actively psychotic don't have that reality testing present or intact rather. Substance and medication induced disorders should also be a differential for DDD. Um, the effects of substances, so the effects of depersonalizing and derealizing during intoxication or withdrawal does not warrant a DDD diagnosis. However, should the individual stop ingesting said substance, but the depersonalizing and derealizing persists after stopping the substance, then DDD can be considered. Um, the most common substances that cause depersonalizing and derealizing to reiterate include ketamine, salvia, ecstasy, marijuana, and hallucinogens. And like I mentioned previously, individuals who get diagnosed with DDD will avoid the misuse of substances due to the fear of having an episode of depersonalizing and derealizing. Traumatic brain injury can also be a differential as well. Um, depersonalization and derealization symptoms are typical in TBI, but they're distinguished from the disorder as symptoms of depersonalizing and derealizing began after the TBI and also do not meet the full criteria of the DDD diagnosis. Personality disorders may also be a differential diagnosis. Um, individuals who have personality disorders may depersonalize and derealize, but their ongoing pattern of inner self or behavior is affected by changes in cognition, affect, interpersonal functioning, or impulse control, which is typically not seen in the diagnosis of DDD. And lastly, as a differential, dissociative symptoms due to another medical condition should also be considered features such as onset greater than the age of 40, atypical symptoms and course suggest an underlying medical condition. Excuse me. Thorough medical and evalu physical evaluation is warranted. So labs, titers, EEG, vestibular and visual testing, as well as sleep studies and imaging should be considered um, in this instance. So you have a patient come in, the clinician has a patient com come in saying that they're dissociating. They do a full psychiatric and medical evaluation and they implement either the dissociative experiences scale, the Cambridge depersonalization scale, both of which lead to scores that suggest high levels of dissociation. The clinician will then open up discussion for the patient to describe their dissociation. And based on the patient's responses, the clinician starts to think, okay, they, it sounds like they're depersonalizing and derealizing and now has DDD as a top differential. And when, when the clinician has DDD as a top differential, what's the management of this condition? So first line for DDD, in the absence of comorbid depressive and anxiety symptoms is psychotherapy. And it's recommended that the patient gets it weekly for a minimum of three months. And the therapy modality that's recommended is cognitive behavioral therapy, as it'll focus on normalizing symptoms and interpretation of their depersonalization and derealization, as well as teach them to block rumination around the condition, resist checking behaviors to see if they, if they are real or not, and will also learn to apply grounding techniques when they start getting distressed by these episodes. As far as psychodynamic psychotherapy goes, this can be indicated for the psychologically minded where vacillating symptoms of depersonalizing or derealizing are related to affect tolerance, confusion, or even fear of separation associated with their emotional trauma. Um, 
There have been no clinical trials conducted supporting its use, but there was um, one case report in which an individual did show improvement in DDD in terms of decreased episodes occurring. Um, for individuals who have DDD with co-occurring depression or anxiety, first-line treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy with the addition of a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Now, there was a randomized trial that did not find the SSRI efficacious for treating the DDD, as in it didn't reduce the episodes of derealizing or depersonalizing, but did find that treating the anxiety or depression led to the patient being less distressed by episodes to even ignoring episodes when they did occur. Um, there is no specific recommendation of one SSRI over the other. So it's really up to the clinician's discretion based on risks versus benefits and side effect profile. Now, if a patient does respond, if a DDD patient does respond to the medication, there's currently no data to guideline duration of medications, but it is recommended to have the patient continue this medication from six to 12 months. So lamotrigine is also an alternative for DDD individuals with no comorbidities or with poor or partial response to initial therapy. Um, it was found to be effective in one randomized clinical trial and the dosage recommendation is 25 milligrams daily for two weeks, and then increasing it to 50 milligrams daily, with the maintenance dose being 200 milligrams daily. There's also clomipramine, and this can be um, started in patients with worsened emotional numbing or blunting that don't improve um, after the initiation of an SSRI or doesn't improve with therapy or both. Um, it can also help with the concurrent depression, anxiety, and the obsessive ruminations. However, there has been no clinical trials that have been conducted to support its use, but one study did show response um, in an individual diagnosed with DDD. The recommendation is starting 25 milligrams by mouth daily and gradually increasing it over the first two weeks to approximately 100 milligrams a day. And there's also naltrexone as an alternative to clomipramine for the same emotional numbing responsive to SSRI or therapy or both. There was a small uncontrolled trial that reported an average of 30% improvement of depersonalizing and derealizing episodes, but there have been no randomized clinical trials supporting its use officially. The recommendation uh, for starting dose of naltrexone is 50 milligrams daily and gradually increasing it to 250 milligrams. As far as antipsychotic medications go for treating DDD, there have been no controlled trials conducted supporting its use. There was a small uncontrolled samples of DDD patients who were prescribed antipsychotics, but they reported that there was no change um, or in the frequency of their depersonalizing or derealizing episodes or they endorsed worsening in terms of the intensity and duration of these episodes. Regarding stimulants, again, no randomized trials have been conducted supporting its use. There was a retrospective report that again showed no change or worsening of DDD symptoms. And electroconvulsive therapy, no con controlled trials have been conducted. Um, however, that same retrospective report showed that three patients who received electroconvulsive therapy showed no change or worsening or endorsed worsening of depersonalization, derealization episodes. So what happens when there's treatment resistance? There is the option of transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, there have been two small uncontrolled trials with the prefrontal and the temporoparietal regions as the targets that showed reduced depersonalizing and derealizing episodes. So there is promising, but it's not officially recommended yet, but it can be considered for clinicians who have done the therapy and the uh, medication recommendations and have failed. 
Um, there's also long-term support of psychotherapy, and this can be for individuals who have chronic depersonalizing and derealizing with severe functional impairments. Um, it has not been tested formally, but it is thought to help with improving their function, fostering acceptance of their condition, as well as adapting um, to their functional impairment with DDD. So case one outcome, which was the 19 year old male with the chief complaint of existential thoughts and dissociation who presented for his first psychiatric evaluation. He was started on sertraline 25 milligrams daily and titrated to his current dose of 50 milligrams daily to target his concurrent depression. Over, his, over the next few visits, his affect and demeanor brightened considerably, and he also endorsed having further episodes of derealizing. Um, of note, while he's taking the sertraline, he also continues to receive therapy regarding his childhood trauma once every two weeks, which is the first line treatment of DDD. Case two outcome, which was a 22 year old female with the chief complaint of quote, I've got a dissociative disorder of some type. She scored a 46 on the dissociative experiences scale version two. And I asked her to elaborate her dissociative episodes and she described them to be derealizing. And so I strongly recommended she seek therapy and to strongly adhere to her acetylopram, which she was taking on as needed basis. So she did follow up with me for two visits and she did adhere to the acetylopram, which she stated helped her mood, not necessarily her depersonalizing and derealizing. And she was in the midst of trying to find a therapist that she could afford. However, after that second visit, she was lost to follow up and I unfortunately haven't seen her. So in summary, with the increase of the word dissociating, it's important to recognize the different forms of dissociative disorders, particularly depersonalizing and derealization disorder. The DSM-5 text revision criteria and exploration of past trauma, typically emotional, is generally found to be the major risk factor. The dissociative experiences scale has been shown uh, to show good convergent validity with other dissociative scales in interviewing and also shows good predictive validity with other dissociative disorders, traumatic experiences, and abuse, but um, its discriminant validity is questionable as the scale is subject to patient response and interviewer bias. Therefore, for the DES, it's recommended to average different scores with different evaluators as it appears to measure current views on past dissociative experiences. There's also the Cambridge Depersonalization Scale the clinician can implement, which has shown high internal consistency and good reliability, but the scale may be limited in accuracy due to not differentiating between past episodes of depersonalization and derealization and current episodes, as well as difficulty for some patients to quantify how long their episodes last um, for each question on the scale. With regards to treatment, if no comorbidities are present, then CBT is a preferred treatment. If comorbidities of anxiety and depression are present, then CBT plus an SSRI is the next step. If both the SSRI and therapy fail or gives a partial response, the clinician can consider adding lamotrigine. If patients do respond to the SSRI in terms of being able to ignore the depersonalization and derealization, episodes, but continue to experience emotional blunting, the clinician can consider trialing clomipramine and uh, or naltrexone. And if there's treatment resistance, limited evidence have shown promising um, results with transcranial magnetic stimulation. And for those who have severe functional impairment, the clinician can recommend uh, supportive psychotherapy as an option. And here are my resources. This concludes my presentation. And I'd like to thank Dr. Bird, who was my faculty mentor for this presentation.